Um, so welcome to London's Calling again, uh, if you haven't been told so already. Um, and hopefully you are expecting this session. Um, if not, you're in the wrong room, but really the right room. Um, my name is Paul Batterson. I am the COO at Cloud Galacticos. We're really excited to be a platinum sponsor here this year. Um, you can find out more about me via various Twitter handles um, for random personal stuff that I post out, and mainly Salesforce, and for some videos that I post up as well. Uh, infrequently, I will say, <laughs> as often as I can. So uh, I want to dive straight in today because this is going to be going to be an interesting talk, I think. Um, and the reason is that you're not going to see any code. We're going to really try and help you understand how machine learning algorithms work. Um, and it's going to be interesting because you're going to be effectively doing stuff that requires a deep understanding of maths. Um, so here loves some matrices and a lot of complicated maths. We have two people, woo! But we're not going to actually see, we're going to see one formula today, OK? And I promise you that everyone will be able to understand that one formula, and that's it. Everything else, lots of pretty pictures. So why am I giving this talk today? Um, so I think I hold a record for being the first person to speak about AI or machine learning at a Salesforce conference. I did a session in 2014 on building machine learning systems in Apex um, at Dreamforce. And really good session, really enjoyed it. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but in the past few years, AI and machine learning in terms of popularity, and this is the Google trends, have slightly increased. Um, and so it's become a hot topic that everyone's talking about. Have you all heard of Einstein? Yes? Anyone here not heard of Einstein? That's a good start. Um, anyone here not heard of Trailhead? Because that'll be even more surprising. So um, it's, you know, it's becoming ever more popular, and when you look at the, the discussion around it, it's very difficult to sometimes figure out what's actually going on. So this is the Gartner hype cycle um, from 2017. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, <coughs> I put four arrows there, <coughs> pointing out to things that have AI or machine learning or something in them. In 2018, that same cycle had five different things, none of them really overlapping. And so you know, for the average human being, it's very difficult to know what's really going on. You know, um, we often get spoken to about you know, machine learning systems, AI, the promise of it, how it's all going to take our jobs away or make us all millionaires or mean that we can all work half a day a week and still have all the money we want in the world. And it's difficult to know what's actually going on and also when it's applicable. Um, you know, when do we actually need to use a machine learning system? When do we just need statistics? And so. The aim of this talk is to try and demystify some of that, to help everyone understand what's going on a little bit in the background, um, and really just to kind of, you know, hopefully end the day or end the session being a little bit more clear as to what the hell this all means. So that's what we're going to try and do. So hopefully, at the end of this session, you'll all understand some of this a little bit more. So we're going to start off with some definitions. So first of all, what is AI? And I don't mean artificial intelligence and someone being smug and telling me that's what the two letters stand for. What do we? What is it really? What is it defined as? So, it's a computer to achieve a specific task. Most AI systems have some reward mechanism. So, uh, has anyone ever seen the video where they uh, try and teach a computer to make a human uh, model walk? No. So, you say this is where you want to go and to invent a way to get there, and it has a mechanism that says the to the end point, the better you do it. will come up with some inventive ways to do it. A lot of people also think of general purpose AI, which is where you can take a machine uh, and it can just do anything like a human can. And say anything like a human can is that I could take anyone in this room and given enough time, I could pretty much teach you anything. Um, as long as I knew it to start off with, otherwise that's going to be really difficult. But everyone in this room has the ability to learn anything they want to. It's something that is uniquely human, and it's actually really hard to get anything else to do it. You know, if you all think about when you were a, a baby or a toddler, you know nothing. And yet here you all are listening to some guy in a shirt stand at the front talk about machine learning and AI in a Salesforce conference. It's, you know, you've learned all about it. You've come quite away. So now we know a bit about what AI is. What is machine learning? Because the terms are often conflated. And machine learning is actually just a subset of AI. It's a way of doing some data analysis to get a specific outcome. And data analysis is actually quite a key point here. Machine learning algorithms 
require vast amounts of data. AI doesn't necessarily require that. Okay? AI systems can just be given a task and run away and keep on doing it again and again and again. Machine learning, you have hundreds of millions of records or examples that you then try and use to spot a pattern. And once you've spotted that pattern, you try and infer another solution. Um, there's a really uh, funny tweet I read the other day, which was someone saying, uh, if you were, uh, who here has had their mum say to them, if all of your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do the same? <laughs> yep, everyone's had that. If you were a machine learning algorithm, you would, because 100% of your friends <laughs> have previously jumped off bridges, and that was the correct thing to do. So what's underlying both of these things is actually just statistics. So what is statistics? Um, and this might sound like a really stupid thing to spend a moment or two discussing, but statistics is information around a data set with some knowledge. So anyone here remembers their IT lessons way back when will remember that you have data, you have information, which is some process form of that data, and then we as humans could infer knowledge from it. <coughs> so we might have a set of data, we might then <coughs> calculate the average of that data, so a set of test scores, we calculate the average of that test score, and then I, as a smart, sentient being, can go, that person scored above or below average. That's the knowledge part. And that's all statistics is, really. And it's something that we can be calculating using the underlying data. And that's important for us to know, is that we need the underlying data for us to be able to calculate the statistics around it. Again, full-blown AI at the other end might not necessarily need that data. But machine learning, which is based on statistics, needs a large set of data to get running with. And so you can think about this as crawling, walking, and running. <laughs> you can think about this as baby, child, and adult. But effectively, <laughs> this is the end where statistics is. You're just doing some basic stuff. So if you have uh, anyone here got young children, you'll probably know that if you have it and you say the same word to them again and again and again, they'll say it back to you eventually. That's how they say mama or dada. And it's pretty much whichever parent is most persistent in pestering them and then leaving the room because they'll say the other one. Um, when you then become a toddler, you start to do what's really more like machine learning. You take the experiences you have around you and you start to infer stuff from it. So you start to learn how to walk, how to run, how to crawl, how to interact with people. And when you move into adulthood, you're really more of a general AI because you can do anything and you can use your past experiences to build up on that. So why has this become really popular in the past few years? Three big reasons. Number one, more data. <laughs> As I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, machine learning systems require vast amounts of data. Um, everyone here old enough to, who here had a computer that used floppy disk as its primary? There we go. So that's, yeah. Imagine the amount of data you can get stored on a floppy disk, and then imagine the amount of data that you can store on your iPhone now, which is effectively the same sort of dimensions. It's vastly different, okay? We've got a lot more data, we're capturing a lot more data, you know, through all of the interactions we're doing, through IoT, through all the different cool pieces of tech. That data is also getting more complex, and we want to do more complex analytics. So if you think about, again, the kind of data that was initially stored on computers, it was largely accounting data. The primary use for computers, when they started out, was accounting and sending spaceships to the moon. That was pretty much it. Now we've got graph databases, and we're doing real-time analytics across IoT sensors to see whether the network's down and which is the best way to route data through it. It's a bit more complex than just deciding whether or not we've made enough money this month. And then finally, is scalability. You know, when most of these machine learning algorithms were de designed, it was back in the kind of 70s, 80s, and 90s. They're really quite old pieces of kit. But the problem is, is that when you're running it on a you know, 166 megahertz computer, there's a limit to how long you're going to be able to spend doing it. Whereas nowadays, anyone can spin up a cloud system and have millions and millions of rows of data being processed every second. Um, if you talk to the Einstein analytics guys, they'll tell you about how many rows of data they're processing and how quickly they can do it, and it's mind-boggling. So that gives us a bit of a brief overview as to what AI is, what machine learning is, what statistics are, where they've come from, um, you know, why it's got more popular. And now we're going to go deeper. So this is the part where we all need to, let's say, just hold on to our hats as we're going to start going into the depths of it. So who here has seen a picture like this before? Good, that's most of the room. That's good. So this is a picture of a neural network. Now, when it comes to machine learning algorithms, this is the sexy picture everyone always sees. 
And I think it's because it's A, colorful, B, got lots of lines on it, and C, it looks a little bit like what you'd imagine a brain to look like. And people inherently like to have pictures that make them look smarter. Hence why I've got this up there. Um, so we can move now. Um, so there's many other learning algorithms. There's things like the k-means clustering, where you can find out groupings of things based upon uh, relative um, distance from other data. Um, but I'm going to go through what this is roughly doing today, because I think it's the most kind of common thing you'll see. And I also think that most people, when they look at it, probably have a few swear words come into their head when they go, what the hell is going on there? And that'll be the politest version we use today. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what's going on here. So we've got an input layer here. These are all the different input variables we've got. And we'll define what an input variable is in a minute. We've then got a hidden layer, which is probably where all the work's being done. And do you know how we can guess that? Because it's called the hidden layer. As soon as anyone ever puts something on a diagram that is a black box or has the word hidden in it, you know that's where the technical complexities lie that people are just getting rid of. And then we've got the output layer, which is our kind of predictions and what we're expecting to get out. So what we need to do is we need to try and figure out what our input is, what this hidden layer is doing so that we can get some output. Does that seem to make sense to everyone? OK. So let's start off with some data. I, when I was a kid, um, I was obviously a really popular and cool kid because I spent most of my life playing a game called Championship Manager, which anyone here played Championship Manager? There's a few nods. Uh, I had a book where I used to record statistics. So Championship Manager, for those who don't know, is a football management computer game. Imagine a spreadsheet turned into a video game. <laughs> That's what it is, right? And you just play football as a manager, and you choose players, and they have statistics and all of this kind of stuff, and how good their heading is, and all of this kind of gump. Um, and I used to have a book where I would record statistics from big teams that I'd built up over the years to try and help me be better at winning matches. I was obviously very cool, as you can imagine. Um, and so when I was thinking about what data we can present today, I went back to some football data. So this is data from the FIFA 19 uh, football game. On the x-axis here, we have the height of different players. Whoops. Um, we have different players' heights. And on the y-axis, we have their weight. And the reason we got this is that everyone understands what height and weight are. Is there anyone that doesn't understand what someone's height or weight is? Good. No. Um, and what we would expect is, you know, as a, if I'm in charge of a football team and I'm doing a nutrition, I might want to know what the correct amount of calories to give someone is so that they can be at optimum weight for their height. Because we don't want players that are too big and bulky that can't move around the pitch. We also don't want players that are too lightweight and will just get knocked off the ball. So we've got 5,000 data points here. It might not look like it because there's a lot of them clustered together, but this is 5,000 data points of different players. What would be the first thing most of us would do when we get this data and we want to predict something? Any guesses? Draw a line. There we go. So what we would do is we would try and do a line of best fit or a regression line. And what this line does is it tells us, based upon all these data points, where the best fit, the kind of where things should go is. So if you're making a prediction, it would be along this line. And I said to you, you would see one formula today, and that's it at the top there. That formula tells us that your weight is roughly 1.4541 times your height plus 68. OK? And that's what we've got out of our data. Now, we could stand there and say, well, these looked a bit anomalous. These look like players who are actually quite short but a bit chunky. Um, so we might want to remove them because they could be considered, yeah, it might be an older player, for example. Um, but what we would get is we would get this data, and then we want to say, OK, well, now we can use that to make some predictions. And that's really what our machine learning algorithms are doing. You know that neural network we had at the start? What it's doing is taking these two different attributes, and weight, and it's then running them through that complex orange mess to try and predict the outcome. So it'll take your height, uh, try and predict your weight using a series of very complicated mathematics. So that's pretty easy for us to think about doing. And do you know what? There's no need for us to have a machine to do that because uh, everyone here can look at that line and understand what that line's doing, right? There's no mystery. But what if we added a third data point? So this is now with age, because older football players tend to move around a little bit less. Um, you know, they're multi-millionaires. Why would they run? Um, and so we can start to draw this. Now, 
Uh, I can only describe this as a bob. Um, anyone here want to try and make a guess at drawing the best fit, what would be the kind of plane, so best fit two-dimensional surface throughout that? No, no one? It's really hard for us to do, isn't it? Like, we as humans have certain limitations, and we could get a computer to plot that for us, but it's difficult for us to really kind of use that information. Um, what happens if I had a fourth dimension? Can anyone think of what a 4D graph looks like? No? 5D? 6D? You know, who here has thought of a 24-dimensional graph in their lives? No one? Um, and that's the problem. So a lot of machine learning and AI comes down to the fact that we've now got all these different data points we use, all these different attributes within the data that make it really difficult for us to understand what's going on as to how they impact it. Because it might be a very subtle impact. It might be that they have a grand impact. But it's really hard to draw 24 bits of data on a graph and not lose your mind. Um, when I was at university, I did a degree in maths, and I had a professor who I think purposely would start off 9 a.m. lectures by saying, consider a five-dimensional sphere. Um, and, you know, as a typical university student, you know, getting up for a lecture at 9 a.m., having been out until 4 a.m. the night before, I don't think I was still drunk enough to consider what a five-dimensional sphere looked like. Um, but you can start to see, you know, these are what some of the things look like. They're mind-boggling. None of us have a clue about what's going on here. So we need to try and find out a way of doing this and getting that data out there. So what our machine learning algorithm is going to do is if we go back to our 2D, because this is a bit comfy and safe for us, our machine learning algorithm is, first of all, going to fit that best line for us, okay? It doesn't matter if it's on a 24-dimensional graph. Machines don't understand that. They don't have eyes and don't need to worry. So they can do that. So they're going to plot that 24-dimensional thing. And they're going to make a guess at it, because when you've got 24 dimensions and 10 billion rows of data, you're probably going to have a guess, first of all, rather than try and calculate it, because there's a lot of data there to run through. So once we've got this guess line, what you then need to do is try and minimize the error on it. Um, and you can see here at the top, we've got this R squared number. And that R squared is basically put error. Okay? So all we need to think of it as is the error. Um, and the way we're going to think about this is if we take this line, and if I tilt the right-hand side up, and I keep the pivot in the middle the same, took the left-hand side down, what happens to my error? It would go up, wouldn't it, on average, because both ends are moving away from the central points. If I did it the other way, the error is going to go up as well. Okay? So what we've got is probably some sort of graph that's going to show us when we move too far one way or too far the other, our error is going to increase. And what our machine learning algorithm wants to do is take that line and minimize the overall error. So it's making better predictions. Does that make sense to everyone? We're trying to take a series of lines on there and find the best one that has the minimum amount of error. Now, in two dimensions, the graph of the error just looks like this. It's pretty simple. If you imagine that we move a line, our uh, line on our previous graph like that. We'll have our error go up here. If we do it like that, our error will go up here. And this is a parabola, OK? And at the bottom here is the minimum amount of error. And that's, that's where we want to get to. We want our machine learning algorithm to run through the system, uh, to run through all the data, run through all the possible lines, or if we're in 25 dimensions, all the possible 25 dimensional lines to find the one that gives us the best values, which means that the error is minimized. Okay? And that's all that machine learning algorithms are doing. At this point, entire room now understands exactly what machine learning algorithm does. Takes a bunch of data, takes a guess at the best fit, works out what the error looks like, and then tries to minimize that error. Does that make sense to everyone? That's good. So the way it does that is what's called a thing called gradient descent. And basically, you have your error function here, and we're just going to deal with two dimensions for now. Um, and what you do is you say to the function, to the um, machine learning algorithm, you're going to try and learn at this sort of rate. And the learning rate is effectively how big a jump you're going to make across this error to try and minimize it. If you have too big a learning rate, then you can jump around really far and miss hit. If you have too small a learning rate, you're going to hit the bottom far more accurately, but it could take forever to get there. And again, if you've got billions and billions of rows of data to process and manipulate through, that could take a lot of time. And you know, not everyone has a lot of time. And so this is just, you know, quite honestly, some simple calculus that's going on in the background. 
It's just that when you're dealing with what would be simple calculus in two dimensions, in 25 dimensions, that becomes a lot of weird matrix maths and <coughs> convoluted stuff, and that's where our computer does our work. So if we take the same idea and were to do it for a three-dimensional set, this is what our error function might look like. And this is what our ideal error function would look like. In an ideal world, we would have a function that tells us what our error looks like. It's a pretty graph like that, and we know we want to get here, right? That's where our error would be minimum. Really simple. We would get that, and we'd be able to predict all sorts of things. That's not sadly how real life works. Um, who here works in a company that has ideal data and works in an ideal way? No? <laughs> Surprise me. Um, this is what it can look like. This is an example. Um, and what you can end up finding is you can end up with all these weird features. So a local minima, you might get to the bottom here, and your machine learning algorithm goes, well, if I go left or right or up or down, the area gets bigger. But it's not actually the best result you're getting. That will be down here. Because, I mean, everyone can see that this one's way further down than this one, right? But the problem is, is that you can get stuck. So a lot of machine learning algorithms as well start off by randomizing multiple times. Companies won't just do a machine learning run once. They'll do it multiple times with different input parameters, different startup, um, what's called a initiating vector. I want to know the, t the lingo. Just to try and get around that problem, because you can just find yourself trapped in different points. Okay? That's really an issue, because if you're spending a thousand hours running through on a computer trying to predict the outcome to decide whether or not your new movie on Netflix is going to be liked or not by the person who's watching it, you want to make sure you're getting that right. You know? So let's go back to where we started off and look at our neural network again. So everyone, everyone happy what our inputs are? They're, they're our attributes, our height, our weight, our age, or whatever else. All good there? Our output layer is the different weightings. You'll notice that there's one less here because one of these is an output value, which is our target value, and these are the weightings. So this will be height, weight, age, I don't know, um, shoe size, and then we might have a fifth one down here, which is what we're actually trying to target, which might be you know, average running distance, uh, running pace. So both of those are okay, everyone happy with that? I'm looking for nods, good. This middle layer then, what's going on in there is what we showed on that picture a second ago. Is what we're doing is we're making some guesses. We're then finding out how far off those guesses are, and then we're trying to minimize that error rate. And so a lot of these um, graphs, when you see them, we'll talk about something called backpropagation. Has anyone ever heard the term backpropagation? Okay. If you haven't, all it means is when I get to this point and find out how wrong I am, I go back, and that's when I do that minimization. And what's really clever about most of these machine learning algorithms nowadays is that they do that in a way that's far more efficient. That's what the power of all of this rubbish in the middle here is, is that you're connecting all these pieces together to get to the bottom of that trough. So you get the most accurate results going. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how a machine learning algorithm works. Does that make sense to everyone? Anyone feel more confused now than they did when they came in? Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> fair enough, Enzo. <laughs> I tried. Um, so to start to wrap things up, I just want to give everyone a quick, simple guide as to when to use statistics, machine learning, or AI, because um, we've all been in conversations with a customer or someone who just says, ah, oh, I want to use AI on this and do something really clever. And you say to them, right, what do you want to do? And they go, I want to use AI. No, no, what do you want to do? I want to use AI. And I can write a press release and say that we're using AI. So the simple guide is, if you have some well-defined rules, it's statistics or if statements, really. Okay? What you're doing is, so if you have some well-defined rules, you can do it in a SQL query or a report. Okay? A, data, a SQL query using this analytics. But if you've got clear rules and you know how they follow through, it is just statistics. Might be slightly complicated, but <coughs> you don't need to go the learning algorithm. When you've got masses of data and you're not really sure how they connect to each other and how they come out, that's when you need to look at machine learning and AI. Okay? And Salesforce follow this themselves. If you look at the Einstein analytics and Einstein data discovery suite, 
they will help you view the statistics through Einstein Analytics and connect the dots so you can start to see that. When you've got masses of volumes of data and you're not sure how things stick together, that's when you use Einstein Data Discovery and start to pick things up. That makes sense for everyone? And so finally, because I want to try and give some time for questions as well, um, because there's either going to be a lot of questions or just eerie silence. Um, I just want to tell you a story. that uh, So this came up on my Twitter feed the other day, and it really like hit the nail on the head for me. So this, I hope everyone recognizes that this is a plane. Okay? Um, and during the Second World War, uh, the RAF were having all of their, uh, a lot of their planes coming back from fighting the Battle of Britain. And what they were doing was they were looking at the planes, and each one of these red dots represents where a bullet hole is. Okay? And what they were trying to do is they were trying to find out where best to place armor on the hurricanes, on the spit and things like that, so that they could minimize the amount of planes they lost. And coincidentally, the amount of pilots they lost, which is quite an important part of flying a plane. So they took all this data, and what they did was they handed it to a man called Abraham Ward. And Abraham Ward was a very well-trained statistician and, and data nerd. And if you look at this, the common sense approach to where to put your uh, armor. Anyone have any guesses? Be where all the red dots are. It's the common sense guess. People are shooting there, put the armor there. The problem is, is that you're only measuring planes that get back. If a plane gets shot down and crashes, you're not going to see the bullet holes on that, are you? And so what he recognized is that he had an incomplete data set. And so what they actually did was they reinforced the fronts. And they had a dramatic decrease in the number of planes they were losing and they were losing because of And the reason I want to follow this story is that all of this other stuff, knowing how the machine learning algorithm works has hopefully been interesting for you and you know, enlightened you a little bit. Knowing how to do some statistics and you know, some interesting information out there is really cool. But it's only as good as the data you start with. If you start off with data that is inaccurate, incorrect, um, has built-in biases, or is just missing something, you're going to get results that do the same. And whenever you have a conversation with anyone about doing one of these things, just take a step back and think, what are we missing in our data? Because if you are missing something, you end up reinforcing the wrong part of the plane, and you can spend millions doing that and get no tangible results. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope this has uh, taught you a little bit. And uh, we've got some time now for questions at the end as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, yeah. so uh, you talked at the end there about, you know, with your data sets, um, you know, overcoming bias. What approaches have you got for overcoming bias in data? So as an example, I now work in recruitment uh, on the IT side. I'm not an evil recruiter. Um, and, you know, our CIO, as you can expect, let's use some AI as you touched upon there. So one of the things that they want to do is, is you know, they have candidates, mm -hmm. they have jobs. Candidates have skills, jobs require skills. Let's see if we can use some AI to match that. My concern is, and I guess this is kind of topical being International Women's Day, is gender bias, race bias, you know, all the other types of, of bias that humans consciously or unconsciously fall into are just gonna get replicated out by the AI. Yep, it's a really good question. So, um, if you have a setup like that, you've got some data, and you, if you're aware that there's going to be an inherent bias, right, which in that sort of data set, there probably is going to be. Right? Just, you know, if you're looking over the past 10 years' worth of data, it's probably going to get better as it goes on, but have some inherent bias. As long as you can measure that bias, you can actually compensate for it. Um, and so there's organizations, uh, I know um, there's one team, uh, I was chatting to a friend of mine, she works, uh, it was one of the SAP incubators, and they were doing something where they were doing that same thing, but what you can do is you can measure the outcome. So in your machine learning algorithm, when it comes out with your output, and you've got your fairly good output, you can then measure that bias, and that allows you to compensate for it upfront if you can do so. Now, I'm saying this very broadly. I understand that the topic matter is an extremely sensitive one in particular, um, and we should try and remove that bias from the data if you can, but the fact is there is going to be inherent bias in almost every data set you get on. So what you need to do is either think about how you can compensate that on the output or remove some of that bias from the data set, either through um, 
just analyzing the data more effectively and then cleaning it up or seeing which things are weighted most heavily and then compensating for that. So you know that output picture we had where we had those different things? If you notice that it's outputting and giving a higher weight to male candidates than female candidates, that's something you can be aware of and try and include in there. But it's, it's a really good point and it's, it goes back to that thing about the data. The data is terrible, you're gonna get bad, out, bad results out. Any other questions? Run over. Do you know, do you know of any uh, examples of people using machine learning in Salesforce today that actually apply to business cases? Because I kind of none of my customers recognise cereal boxes or cats or anything. What do you mean people don't use people don't recognise cats on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah. So uh, the I'm not going to give you an answer, but I'm going to give you a pointer to the answer. There is two people wandering around today called Skip Souls and Chris Jolly, and a third one, Kate Toporsky. They are, and uh, Ricky Hovgard, in fact, if you've got one of these beats, you can see Ricky there. They are all on the Einstein analytics team. They can tell you about all the different use cases they've got from real customers going on there. Um, in terms of seeing different things, uh, I've done work with healthcare companies that have seen, uh, that have been using AI, not Einstein analytics, as they have the data off platform, but we're using it to help predict where they should be targeting their efforts in, um, in educating people about a certain disease. So it was a disease that had uh, genetic uh, markers, and so it was prevalent in certain groups. So uh, uh, people of Portuguese descent were more likely to have disease, so they went away and found some demographic data that told them where people from Portuguese descent were, and then they could use and track where these groups moved across the continental US to try and help improve their outcomes there. So that's one example. Um, but yeah, definitely talk to Skip, Ricky, Kate, or Chris. They are also doing a session today, um, so go and they can they can talk your ear off as to use cases. Yeah, do you want to pass the? Oh, you got it already. Yeah. Uh, would you say that Einstein Analytics now? W would you recommend start with Einstein Analytics to you know to learn about deep learning or there are libraries like TensorFlow? So, if you want to learn about deep learning and kind of more of the machine, depends on what you want to do. My, my advice is always stand on the shoulders of giants. So deep learning and the TensorFlow library, don't bother trying to rebuild that. Like there's a million PhDs that have gone away and spent time doing that. Use that, learn how to use it effectively. Don't waste your time on that. Um, if it depends on what your outcome is and what your use case is. My advice is always start off with analytics. And it could be Einstein analytics, and we're at Salesforce events, so it should, ooh, so it should be Einstein analytics. Um, but it could be any data visualization tool that you might want to use. Um, but start off at that point because you may find things that you can just visually see within your data that are going to be far more valuable to you than spending a lot of time analyzing stuff. And once you've got, so the way that Einstein, and what's particularly nice about the Einstein setup is that once you've got these data sets in analytics and you're visualizing them, then you can pass them on to data discovery to do some of the what if analysis and, and machine learning work, and it will take away a lot of that for you. If you have a highly customized data set doing something very, very specific off of the platform, then that's when I would say something like TensorFlow or something like that um, might be a better choice for you. So if you are trying to build a, a system that will go in and generate faces, like has anyone seen the NVIDIA thing where they generated a bunch of, yeah, they generated a bunch of real looking human faces from pictures. Well, you can't do that with Einstein, it's not gonna do that. Don't bother using it for that. But I would imagine that 99% of our business cases, as it was alluded to a minute ago, are going to be far more around the actual practicalities of how do you get some data, how do you visualize it, and then how do you work out how to use it. Um, there was a really good example data set the Einstein team had as well for uh, what's called the, the Chicago version of the Boris bikes. Um, and I know people don't like them being called Boris bikes. But yeah, you know the, you know, the, the free bikes that you can get, or the, or the bikes that you can rent out. Uh, there's a data set from the Chicago version of those, and you can see how that data goes through, and that works really well in Einstein Analytics. So um, look at Kaggle as well if you want some examples for other things. Does that help? Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? Cool. Well, again, thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully this has been useful in general. Yeah, this is off the record. Well, I think we're still recording. But yeah, hopefully it has been useful. Um, hope you enjoy London's calling. I'll be... Uh, our booth as well later on if anyone wants to have a broader chat or have any other questions. So thank you. <laughs>